Jared Poland Fronos Photo. Dot com and today we have a special raw talk for you. What episode, Stephen? Two two six, right? Today we're in the Hollywood Hills to interview Douglas Kirkland as well as his wife Francoise. Uh, they've opened up their house for us to come in and do an interview, uh, as well as I've done a bunch of candid images for one of my personal projects, which was a day in the life of. Uh, and then we sat down to have a pretty intimate interview with Douglas and Francoise, and this is it. So go ahead, sit back and enjoy. So do you do you see light? Like, do you see the images before you capture them? Is that something that you see the images before? I do see the images before, frankly. Uh, I feel them, I see them. But I think he does see the light. He yeah. does, it, I mean, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Like, like yes, actually it was like yesterday morning or the day before, we were waking up and I was just lying there and it was like, you know, I don't always think that I look fantastic early in the morning, you know, sort of you're always a bit worried. And somehow the light was falling right and he got, he got the, the cell phone because that's all that, that there was. And he shot a wonderful picture of me. I mean, it's a very, I mean, it's, normally I wouldn't let pic pictures, you know, without makeup or anything like that, but, sure. but the light was just hitting right, so yes. It was glorious. How did you learn composition? How did you learn exposure? Because obviously all of those things go hand in hand with getting great images. I started in Canada in a tiny town called Fort Erie. And I got working, I managed to get myself a job in their local studio. I then went from that How to shooting with a speed graphic, a, a four by five camera. And I was, uh, I think at the time I was like 13. Oh wow. And so that's when I started taking pictures and I ended up covering weddings, photographing babies and all that sort of thing, and but I kept getting magazines like Popular Photography and Modern Photography, and that uh, created dreams for me. I think that Douglas sees the world better through a camera. Mm. I mean, it's it's really an an instinct. It's not like just. I mean, of course, I think one learns over over a period, but. I don't think he had to learn. I think that's how he saw the world, was, I mean, through the camera. It's my passion. It's really his passion, yeah, that's, and which is why he won't stop. You don't want to stop. I'm yeah. assuming you don't want to stop, right? No, I don't. It's un unthinkable. The only time I'll stop was when this heart stops. And I, I feel I have a, quite a good years good. ahead of me, even though I'm 83 and been doing it since I was 12 and uh, working in Fort Erie at the Fort Erie, Fort Erie Photo Studio. So was, was there a mentor? Was there somebody that took you under their wing and really showed you the ropes and helped you get from that 13-year-old to where you were going? Irving Penn was a very important reference to me. I had a job in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and uh, I went from there to uh, one of the people in, that I went to uh, in, in, the, in the trade, trades of advertising and everything there, uh, introduced me to P Irving Penn, and I managed to get a, an interview with him, and he said to me, uh, we're fully staffed and we don't need anybody, and I showed him my pictures and talked a little more, and he said, wait a minute. One of our guys is going in the army, and just at the end of this year, and there's a possibility that you might fit in to that. He did go in the army, and Douglas Kirkland was jumped at the opportunity, the chance to work with Irving Penn, and that was the put me on a great flight because. It made me see and think and think of images. Well, most people think of uh, the camera as just a device to uh, take the pictures of their friends or whatever inspires them. But uh, with pen, it was design and, and uh, it was Vogue magazine uh, and work of his own. And he, he had a, 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 an incredible life um, and just died a few years ago. And I have his books downstairs to this day, 
He was a great inspiration. And you printed uh, color for him. I printed color. Oh, really? I, yeah. it, Nobody I, knew how to print type color. C. Early type tray? C. In the trays? Uh, yeah. How, That's how, right. Did you come out with the bleach stains all over? I remember when I did that in college, I had stains all over because I just well, I did couldn't, too. Because I couldn't see the I was agitating too hard, and so it would splatter all over the place. You obviously had the passion as well. Yeah, like I did. And photography's been very, very kind to me and very good to me. I met Francoise in Paris, and we've been married 51 years now. And uh, I was there to photograph Audrey Hepburn. And uh, her, her mother was working on a movie, Audrey was working on. And she came to visit her mother one afternoon on a Friday. And that was the beginning of the romance, which has gone on more than 50 years now. That's good. We're very lucky. That is, that's really the good. Ca camera's been part of that. And yeah. Canon has been part of that well. through the years. I know you put it. You put it right yeah, there. Yeah, they said that's the menage à trois. There's, there's, a, there's three people in this marriage. There's Douglas, the camera, and Francoise. Uh, <laughs> and that it's works. It's true. It works. It works. Well, you know, I found very early on that I, mean, I wasn't trained at all to be in photography. She was an interpreter. I was an inter simultaneous interpreter, and I came from a family. My 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 stepfather was a journalist. A political journalist uh, uh, in and Britain. I didn't know. No, he was he was working. He was living for, in Paris. He was living in Paris, but he was a bureau chief at the London Sunday Times. I was. I mean, I, my parents had like artists, you know, painters and sculptors and, and people like this. They were very bohemian, but photography was not really recognized very much as such. So when I met Douglas, I didn't know that much about photography. I just thought he was like a little bit insane when he first photographed me. I thought. You know, oh my God! I mean, this like this very gentle. There's a picture person. right back there that well, I did. Like, in the, there's some also downstairs. Or, uh, early days. This very gentle, laid-back man suddenly turned into this kind of like monster or something, like sort of like you know. Like, and but I anyway, I learned very early on that if I really wanted to have this marriage work and have a relationship, is that. I had to also get in, involved in the photography and in the work, and I wasn't going to be a photographer because I mean one is enough, you know, one very talented is enough in the, in, in the in the in the couple, but I had to find a place for myself because otherwise, the, the, you know, then you get kind of left behind. I mean, oh, you have nothing to talk about. You you, you know, it's it's not like you're a banker and and you, you work somewhere and you come home and you put it away. I mean, this this stays with us at night. It's like. You know, in the middle of the night. I mean, we and and we, so we started to work very, very early on. You know, together, and and I just kind of reinvented, reinvented myself to to fit into his world. And in and, New um, York, it was we we lived in New York in the yeah, early days. Yeah, we lived days. in New York in the early, early days, and and then you know, we as I told you before, we did you know we we we, we did movies. That's where I learned how to do sound, and we. We'd, whatever needed to, to needed to be done. I mean, it was kind of fun to do it. The, the journey is together, which is really wonderful. I mean, I mean, I'm curious about what was it like traveling in the '60s around the world. It was. It was much easier. Yeah. Really. It, it was yeah, so much was. easier, because well, there were like different different jobs. But first of all, like everything was a hell of a lot less expensive, and even you know comparatively, you could live. We, we, we lived really wonderfully because we, we were paid not enormous amounts of money. It wasn't, we weren't doing much advertising because Douglas chose to do more editorial, but you had your expenses paid. And sometimes we'd take a first class ticket and we'd get two economy tickets and you know, it, was, it was not as uncomfortable as f traveling now. And all our expenses were paid, paid. So we were living like very wealthy people without money, you know, and we lived on traveling the upper west was, was side of yeah New York. yeah traveling was easy. I mean, you could get to the airport at the last minute. You could, I mean, the only thing is that excess baggage. I mean, they used to rape us with ex excess baggage shot, but usually the film companies would pay for it. But if we were we, working on we, a movie, we didn't even travel with assistants most of the time. We we worked on film sets and we'd just get somewhere. We'd stay in the best hotels, and then you you, you the, the great thing also is that you had you went on a job and you go and visit the set, not even take pictures necessarily. 
Exactly. And then you'd sort of like go, maybe if the, there wasn't a scene that you wanted to see, you'd go and do something else for a couple of days and then you'd come back and you'd, you know, work. I mean, you had like two, three weeks on a job. Mm -hmm. wow. Generally. You know, and, and the, the publicists also were not quite as protective. They, were, they wanted the magazines like Look Magazine and Life right. Magazines. So we were kind of fettered, you know, we, you, could, you were kind of greeted, not like, like thieves, like, you know, people who are kind of there, you know, and everybody opened their, their doors. So you had access. Naming a few, Bridget Bardot, Jean Moreau, uh, Bridget, well, I mean, the, the, the Countess of Hong Kong, you know. Um, Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin, you know, we, we, we were London. on the set for like three weeks. Oh, Very oh. well paid, by yeah. the way. It was well paid, but it wasn't enormously paid. It wasn't advertising rates. It was comfortable. It was a, just a very comfortable. It was a nice life. And, and, and um, yeah, you picked up and you just went from place to one place to another, you know. How did you maintain the rights to the images? Because I saw all the uh, negatives and... We maintained the rights at, at, because at that time, what Douglas, the, what happened with Look Magazine is Look Magazine gave the rights back to photographers. It's a long story, but we don't need to tell the whole story. I was a member of the American Society of Magazine Photographers. ASMP. And ASMP, and they strongly urged photographers to fight for their rights. Yeah, but at Don't this, just give it away. But now, at this time, you can't fight for your rights because you have to give it away. I mean, now if you work for a film company, you they have to... They won't hire you unless you No, they you won't hire you. It it's very, very simple. You, you, you work for hire, and, and that's the way it is. And it's since, probably I would say since about like the, the, the late 80s, sometimes you can make an arrangement where they'll let you use the pictures for a certain... Uh, purposes, but not, you know, to, to, it's, it's all a question of relationships, I think, also, it's like who, if you, if you behave yourself and Always you're not, you know, you are. You know, and, but, but with film companies now, you can't own your material. With, with magazines, you can, if you're freelance. And um, although some, I, you know, I hear that Vogue, you know, people, Condé Nast owns everything, but we've managed to keep the copyright of a lot of Material. Photography has been very good to yeah. us, wouldn't you but say? But we have Francois? managed to keep the, the rights to, to our archives, most of our, most of our archives, I would now, say. Now, did you have to do model releases, or was it just a given? No, no you don't. Do, celebrities, I, I, I don't know exactly you know, what the, the laws are, but I mean, at least with celebrities, you don't... That you don't ask celebrities to do to sign model releases, and right. and they're they're public fig figures, so they cannot be used for advertising. Obviously, you can't unless use this unless they give you their approval. Right, um, and you're usually paid more for that. Yeah, well, they, well the, 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 the person also is 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 uh, is paid as well. But editorially, you have the rights to use the pictures editorially. Never throw anything away. Never ever throw. I say that to young photographers. I mean. You have to obviously throw certain things because I mean people shoot too much now because of, of digital. You never know what 30 years from now is going to be of interest, historically or even taste-wise, because your taste changes. And you know, we used to love all the beautiful portraits of all the big stuff. I mean, like everybody, but now you know, you, when you look at the picture of Judy Garland with. Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin like laughing on a set. I mean, that, that is precious, but that was considered images, uh, secondary images for the back of the magazine. Hmm. You know, they weren't important, really. They were just kind of part of the reportage, which was, you know, not as, you know, you, you do the cover, the lead, and then... Images for in between. Yeah. But those shots are the, the photos. Those are, those are the precious things. There's still images to discover. It's like sort of this bottomless treasure. Originally, like I think I was also telling you that before, you know, when we would shoot, Douglas would edit, and he would edit for the, for the specific story that this was, so it was supposed to be like whatever, you know, 10 pages and a cover or whatever. So he'd edit, you know, the, the pictures, and then those pictures would run in the magazines. The one that didn't run would sort of go in, I guess, the seconds or whatever. And then we didn't think about them anymore, we'd go on to the next job. And, and the next, and we were traveling and, a lot. And so, so for a long time, we just had like the primo images, you know, Douglas is known for certain images that everybody recognizes, they're pretty. In 2006, 
we did um, an exhibition in Rome. We were with some friends. We have Douglas has done a lot of work in, in Italy, and this this person who had the gallery wanted to do something called um, kind of behind the scenes. A life in pictures. No, no, it wasn't a life in pictures. It was the, it was it was sort of a behind the scenes. The sort of um, uh, pictures that were not like the well-known portraits. So we we edited a few sort of, you know, kind of like interesting images for this. Coming back from Rome, we met Marta Hallett of Glitterati, who is our publisher. And I showed her the little brochure that we'd done at the, this exhibition. It was like all these, and she said, I love them. Do you have 500 more like this? I mm. want to do a book. I said, yes. And then she I said, know. okay. And Douglas kind of like. And again, can you have them in a month? No, no, wait, wait because he, she said, well, I'll do a book for, this was 2006. She said, I'll do a book for 2008. And I said, no, 2007. I mean, it's like, it seems like such a long time, you know. Yeah. She said, okay, well, then I need the 500 pictures or, or 1,000 pictures at least by in a, month, a month from now. And Douglas thought I was absolutely out of my mind. I, so we came I home. I didn't say anything, but I was choking. Uh, I was. We came home. But I'm just, this is the point. Is, I'm talking about going through the archives. And we came home, and I started like looking at our database and thinking of which boxes of images, of, 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 of jobs, would be interesting for this behind the scenes, which eventually got called freeze frame. So I started taking boxes out, and, and then we, you know, Douglas it works completely different than, than I do. He looks at one image and he can stay on it for the rest of the day or the rest of the week. Uh, and so I gave him a box of things and he stayed on one image and he said, there's nothing here. And I thought, oh dear, we're really in trouble. So I started doing a pre-edit and giving him like, let's say 10 or 20 images from each take so that he, I mean, because it would have to be his choice, obviously. But he couldn't just stay, and, and then I would r remove them and we'd get, get them scanned. I mean, we had a scanner, thank God. And we did it in one month, but, but it, was, it was this kind of like insane thing. And we started discovering images that we didn't even know we had. I mean, like I found uh, something that became another book. I found a whole envelope that had what has become the Coco Chanel book. Yeah. All, I thought there were no, only two or three images. I didn't know Douglas when he did Coco Chanel. I found this whole, you know, stack of contact sheets and negatives somewhere in an envelope. And it became a book. So this, the wealth of archives. With the, you brought up the Coco Chanel. That's all photojournalistic work. Yeah. Um, you spent three weeks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. How did that, was that a job or did you just yeah. say? No, it was a job. I worked at Look and... Uh, there was a difference within the magazine. The, uh, the head editor was from the sports world, and he wasn't interested in the, what the fashion department head uh, wanted to do a, a story on Chanel. That's why it was a black and white story. And, that, and then Douglas had to also like, like pass the test of seducing Mademoiselle because she didn't know who he was. I mean, he was this young, young photographer. Yeah. So she I made him photograph some fashion and bring it back to her, print it, have it printed in Paris at, at uh, what was it, Pictorial Service, yeah. which still and exists. I didn't think any French at that time. Hmm. And it was very difficult. And but, um, there wasn't that much spo English spoken. But Douglas that, that was like the mascot of the models. I was, we, we did a, a lecture uh, like a few years ago when the book came out. And um, one of the models was in the audience, and Douglas said, oh, all these models were so nice to me. They really sort of took me under their wing, and this woman is sort of like, like her name up. is Jackie Rogers. She, she stood, stood up, up and she said, no, we just sort of wanted to do him. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that, that's I need to shoot some more of that stuff. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> that sounds like where it's at. I mean, she opened up once you did the test yeah. shots. Oh, yes. Uh, totally, and I spent two and a half weeks. She took with, you on her wing. With, with open, she said you must learn French. I did, and uh, she said this is the beginning of your career, 
and it did work out that way. Relationships are huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've met a lot of people, and I'm sure it's opened many doors because you have the respect of who you're photographing. How important have the, has the relationship building been uh, in your career? Exceedingly important. Uh, and once you get sufficiently established, they want you more than you want them. But it's also a question of trust. And yeah. we talked about that before. Douglas loves people, and he ne will never let out some pictures that he feels is are not negative. a negative, or that are not good, or that is, that shows somebody in, a, in not a very nice light. Right. Um, I'm and, not a, a tra and if traditional somebody, paparazzo. No, it's not even a paparazzo, though. There's some people who, who thrive on looking edgy or whatever, you know, look, no, looking edgy, or it's not, but, uh, but people know that, most everybody knows that if you're going to be photographed by Douglas, the pictures are going to be as beautiful as they can be. Right, and I remember and, with uh, Jim Marshall, when I would talk to him, uh, and he said that he always edited his own stuff. Mm -hmm. Always. He never put anything out. If He never was told that he put something bad out because yeah, he would yeah. never put something bad no, out. No, he was no, a wonderful just, you guy. Just don't, you just, those are kills. They're, you know, interestingly enough, Douglas, you know, I mean, there's other photographers with Marilyn Monroe who showed the, the, the kills of Marilyn Monroe. Douglas who destroyed the, them. Yeah. That's it. They're, they're, they're just, they're, they're, she killed some pictures as well. Right, she, I, I think what I've read is that she would make you bring her the, yeah. the images and cut the negatives up in front yeah. of you? Oh. But she wouldn't cut them necessarily, like, if you'd still, you could take them, you know. Okay. I mean, there, there, there are the people who've, who've used those images with the, with the, the, the cross on them. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, the, the ones that were destroyed have been published a lot. Really? And we've never done anything like that. I mean, with any any celebrity, you know, right. you don't sort of, you just don't do that. I respect people, and they're doing their profession, and I want to do mine, as I'm sure many of you do. Absolutely. So, speaking of Marilyn, how did that shoot come about in 1961? Right. Okay. I, uh, I worked for Look Magazine. I was I, the new young discovery at Look. I was in because my mid-20s. Because of Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, I came here to do some other work, and they said to me, Elizabeth Taylor had not been photographed for about close to a year because she had been ill after the first attempt to make... Uh, Cleopatra. Cleopatra. It was the second time, and they did accomplish it, but... At that, on that first occasion, they, uh, that's what happened, and uh, the, they didn't get any filming done. So uh, the film company were very concerned. What happened but anyway, is... Look Magazine, Look Magazine asked, she, was, she, they, 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 she agreed to an interview with no pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... I came with a journalist. <laughs> I was working in Northern California doing shooting fashion. And they said, get to Las Vegas, because Elizabeth Taylor has not been photographed for and if you can, a year. And if you near can, year. take a picture, you know, like, like this. So what did you do at the end of the interview? I, I, the gentleman who was interviewing her was a, a well-known journalist, his name Jack Hamilton. And uh, I had a very good relationship with him. And uh, what he said is, I can't guarantee you you can get pictures but what I did uh, uh, I watched the interview and at the end I, I walked over to her and I'm give me your hand for, for just a second pretend you Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor. Taylor thank you hey uh, I said Elizabeth I'm new with this magazine could I'm looking straight in her eyes those beautiful blue eyes of hers I said <laughs> Elizabeth, could you imagine what it would mean to me if you gave me an opportunity to photograph you? She thought for a moment, and she said, okay, come tomorrow night at 7. And that launched my career of photo working on movies and photographing celebrities. So that's, then, then that, that's how like, like he got chosen to photograph Marilyn, which was, if I remember correctly, for the 
25th anniversary of Look magazine, mm. but it wasn't even like a major story on Marilyn. He photographed a whole portfolio. We have the uh, we have the issue if you are interested in in sure. seeing it, because in the issue there's Shirley MacLaine, Judy Garland, um, Marilyn. Who else? Is well, well, I can't remember, but you, we, we can open it up and see. It's we 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 found we we got it from uh, from eBay. Actually, we found it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> And the funny thing about that is that we, the first magazine we got, we, we needed it to have the Marilyn picture and the the Marilyn had been stolen. taken stolen oh, out. But wow. anyway, so that's that. To make a long story short, Douglas was hired to do this. All these stars who, what you want After to be remembered Marilyn. in, you know, in fifty years or twenty five years or whatever. And so he got to Marilyn, and the rest and so was that history. Was, that was my story. What What did she say to you during the shoot? She I said, want I want to be alone with this boy. <laughs> and I find it really, it generally works better that way. <laughs> so everybody was cleared out of the place we were shooting in, which was at a, a studio in here in Hollywood. And there I was. Dangling uh, over the thing like a piece of candy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you put yourself in that place and imagine here's, a superstar, and you're from a town of 7,000 people in Canada. You can't believe what is going through your head, but you know, excitement and, uh, but I had the edge because I had to make that work. And if I didn't make that work, that was, my career was going to be down the tubes very quickly. That, that shoot went well, and uh, that was it. And uh, that established me as photographing a lot of stars, as they yeah. say, as they jokingly would say, stars or stars. <laughs> yeah. You said you were shooting hot lights mm -hmm. back. How, how difficult was it to shoot in with basically not a lot of light? Well, I was using, a, I used an 80 millimeter lens. At that time, I was using a Hasselblad. And I was shooting it wide open at 2.8 and uh, shooting um, at something like, or I had a 50 too, and it was a 50 also. And uh, that I had to go to F4 as my maximum stop. And uh, I was shooting very carefully, and we still have the pictures on our wall. To you know, this the day. interesting thing is that Douglas often doesn't remember the name of the people, but he can tell you what the exposure is what the f-stop, whatever, you know, like what lens he used, pretty yeah. much. But sometimes, but then the name is like, it's all like a blur. When I heard you speak in Burbank, we talked about digital. And you were one of the early people to jump on digital where your counterparts poo-pooed it and mm -hmm. didn't, they, they basically were yelling at you for going digital. Mm -hmm. what, what was the story there? Douglas has always believed in, in you know, anything that's progressing, new, progress, and, uh, progress and everything. But what happened, it was especially in France, actually, even more than here, but it actually even also in New York, people, you know, kind of like were not very happy that he was doing digital and doing things. I was destroying photography. And they, they, this would, I think I told you the story about these French photographers who sort of said, He's, you're destroying photographer. You have to stop that. It Il must faut be stopped. Ça. <laughs> it must like be the, stopped. Yeah, they were sort of like, and they can, you know, the, 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 the French can be intimidating when they're kind of like being negative. It was on their high like, horse. Oh my God, they so were on their speak. high horse. But anyway, they were all, of course, using digital now. Yeah. Those but, who are still around. Yeah. <laughs> was I, was, there, I was young at that time. You weren't that young. You weren't that young. I mean, it was like the 90s. Was there mm -hmm. ever a, like a rat pack of photographers that you hung out with where you would meet up every so often, have a discussion? Uh, there were some groups, uh, ASMP, American Society of Magazine Photographers, media. They changed it later to media photographers. But, but I it think originally it's that was, we didn't really hang out. We hung out in New York. We hung yeah, out with the... We lived in New York at that time. Not a rat pack. Really sort of weird. There was a, a group of people that we, we, we didn't discuss photography necessarily. We just, we, we, we socialized. We were, we were sort of friends. We mm. were socialized. Um, you know, Pete Turner, Jay Mizell, um, a number of others. None of, a number of others who had studios. Um, one one of the things that was absolutely wonderful wonderful was 
when when um, Rick Small and, and David Cohen did the Day in the Life projects, and we were part of it. Uh, Douglas did almost all of them, and that was a great way of hanging out because you'd, you'd get like a 50 or 100 photographers in a, in a, in a city and then they get dispatched to cover the, the country. So that was... The, that, different places on the, in the country. And you'd have basically one day there. And then we and hung out... To make the, your the, the, the other thing that we did of hanging out with photographers, there was a very, very special thing that Eddie Adams, you know who Eddie Adams yeah. is? Eddie Adams created the Eddie Adams workshop and we were there from the beginning and that was like a week where you'd go to the farm near Liberty, New York. It's still happening. We haven't gone in a, in a, in, in a few years. Uh, we've only gone a couple of times since Eddie died, but th that was, you know, th those were the things of hanging out with a group of photographers and looking at the work and, and everything. And trying to help them. Yeah. Beginners. I mean, I, I've seen in the book. There's Andy Warhol. Did you spend a lot of time photographing Andy? Just a, I on spent assignment. One, night, one morning. One, one morning. morning. It was morning actually. At the and, Chateau uh, Lamont. Yeah, yeah, it was part of an o overall story of different uh, directors. Directors. And, yeah, it was and Hollywood. It was a Hollywood story for Look Magazine. We were staying at the Chateau Marmont. And yeah, we lived in we New York at the time. We lived in New York, yes, and we came and we got a big room and that became the studio. Douglas has always thought that the studio is a state of mind, but you could make a, you didn't really need to try and impress people with having some extraordinary space. People didn't mind if you came to some living room in the, you know, the Chateau Marmont or some, something, I mean, you just made. Made it work. You made it work, you know? Yeah. Very much like we do today. Yeah, but I think now there's a little bit more formality necessary. I mean, if we, if we, if you photograph somebody and you didn't have like, like all the lights and the studio and the assistants and the hair and the makeup and everything, people would get a little insecure. Yeah. You, you need a bit more stuff. How did you keep it fresh? Because I know you've evolved over the decades. How, what was well, your mentality? I, I there? was interested on, and always in technology, photographic technology. And uh, I, if there was a new camera, I was the first person to try to get a hold of one and see what it would do. Uh, same that was true of lights. Later, I was making some movies, and it was all of the photography plus uh, sound and stories and all that, and you and writing a script. I remember the first time when, when Douglas was working with a computer, we didn't have a scanner and mm. we didn't have a printer. So he would work on, the, on the, an image on the computer when he really first discovered Photoshop and was like totally crazy about it. So then, you'd, first of all, you'd have to scan the image, you know. Or then have you, it you, scanned. Or have it scanned. Someone. Yeah, have it scanned. We didn't we did. have our scanner and then, originally. Or we had some lousy little low-end scan. And then he'd work on it and then we'd go and take it to a lab where they would print it and then if he didn't like it, you'd have to, you know, so it's, it has changed. It's a blessing and a curse, frankly, because you're always working yeah. on the top of everything. So, you, yeah, I mean, there's like, it's like constant, there's constantly stuff to learn, is this constantly, constantly stuff to, to be doing. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's wonderful, but. Well, that is, that is good because the technology is always changing and the fact yeah. that you're still up on it working with Photoshop and Lightroom and, mm -hmm. And printing stuff on the on the printers, I mean, it was really cool to watch, um, you know, to see the orders and then have to hand sign everything. And it's amazing how it's done today. You it's print amazing. It all out. It's totally amazing. It's it's revolutionized everything. And but I think we that, did, that, we did that connects with people. I think in terms of fr the freshness I'm of the images. With all of you as well yeah, but here today. Like um, that's, he's interested that's in I people. Feel. We think of, of, of what you want to do with, you know, if, if somebody's coming to the studio to be photographed. But in the end, it's not just all about the technical. It's not all about the idea that, that it's, it's about some, something a bit more elusive. Anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No. And I think that's pretty cool. Because I, I appreciate you guys having us here today to, I love to shoot you guys. some photos. I want to photograph uh, you before can, the... 
We can do that. Before you leave. He's got... He's, we, he's, he's, we can make it work. We can make it work. We'll make yeah. it work. I, I should show you maybe that, that, uh, that Look magazine sure. at some point. We this definitely is, can uh, do that. This is one of the latest pieces of equipment. Are you shooting raw, though? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm yes, shooting raw. Yes, we shoot raw. <laughs> we shoot raw. <laughs> So there you have it. There's so much more information out there, to be honest with you. There's only so much we can do in one interview. Uh, and I highly recommend you check out Douglas's books. We'll link most of them down below. But you can get an understanding for what he's been shooting since the early 60s all the way through today, the celebrities that he's photographed. I mean, it's, it's everybody who was a who's who in the Hollywood world, even the old school Hollywood world. There's some awesome books that you really need to check out. So they're linked below to, to Amazon uh, and, and go get them. That's it. So again, I wanna thank them for opening up their house and I wanna thank you guys for watching. And that is another special edition of Raw Talk. Jared Poland Froknowsphoto.com. See ya.